Welcome to this special edition of The Bottom Line. I'm Susan Kennedy. Poverty is on the rise and Montgomery County has not been insulated from this trend. The county is experiencing its highest poverty rate in two decades. There are more than 72,000 residents who live in poverty here. New residents continue to immigrate here from other countries and many of them have lost their jobs in the service sector due to the recession. But the face of poverty here has also taken on a new look, and as the recession continues to linger, poverty has moved into the suburbs of Montgomery County. By any standard, Montgomery County is a fortunate community both socially and economically. However, hidden among the large homes that line River Road are thousands of county residents who are poor. It's really hard to be poor in a wealthy county. Uma Alawalia has been the head of the county's Health and Human Services Department since 2007, shortly after the recession began to take its toll on Montgomery. We have something called a self-sufficiency standard that says for a family of three to live in Montgomery County, that is a single mom with a preschool-aged child and a school-aged child is about $76,000 without any kind of assistance, public or private, right? Um, but the federal poverty threshold is about $17,000 for that same family. And about 7% of the nearly 1 million people who live here fall below the federal poverty guidelines. About $18,500 a year for a single parent and two children, and $26,000 a year for two adults with three children. And with the cost of living here in Montgomery County higher than the national average, it's been difficult for many residents to afford their basic needs. Can I help you? You would need a box uh -huh. to put things okay. in? Councilmember Nancy Florine says she doesn't think most residents realize poverty is a real issue here. Do you need glasses? I get really kind of frustrated when uh, I see residents engaged in great support systems for other places and don't appreciate the need right here at home. They're pretty. And that's because the poor are pretty much invisible. Uh, they're busy working really, really hard uh, to take care of their families and to get a better life. And I, I think our job as uh, legislators is, is at least to get the facts out there uh, so residents know what we face and what our community faces in terms of planning for its future. In the past five years, the county's Health and Human Services Agency has seen a 52 percent increase in its food stamp caseload. There's also been a spike in demand at Mana Food, where they are now serving an average of 3,600 families a month, and the faces of those clients have changed. What we see is that folks who maybe had some savings and lost their job or their job cut back on hours or pay, um, that savings gone. And so now they're at the point where they need to find additional sources of support like Mana Food Center. I was very surprised to see the need in Montgomery County. And my gym always did a food drive for Mana, but again, it was just a place. Mm -hmm. And coming here and seeing the need, it's just, and we, we've had people come in and, and Actually, they were contributors here before, and now they needed our help. That was one story that just really surprised me. Foreclosures, lost jobs, and other crises have introduced middle-class families to the county's food pantries and other social services. You have, you have choices of what kind of... Mana serves clients like Susan, a single working mother with two children who is just trying to make ends meet. By the time she pays her bills, she has nothing left for food. You know, you already pay bills and you have nothing else in your hand. And you have to um, worry about food and the kids looking out forward for you to bring food at home. It's, it's really sad that you can't able to provide for them everything that you can. So by helping us having some food, it's, it's a blessing. Thank you. Talk a little bit about what you have to do to not live on assistance. This young Montgomery County single mother of three who wished to remain anonymous can empathize. She works 40 hours a week and is currently living in a townhouse in Kensington thanks to the Housing Choice Voucher Program and the county's Family Self-Sufficiency Program. She told us in Montgomery County, it's hard to get ahead. I make 32000 a year and I bring home about eighteen, and 
it's, you know, with childcare, with, um, you know, the utility bills, um, just everyday life, gas, kids need medicine, they get sick. It's just hard to keep up with all everything. And I get assistance and I'm still struggling. So it just feels that, you know, this area is very expensive. And every time you try to move a step ahead, you're pushed back 10 steps. <laughs> That's cute. That's going to look good on you, Sam. Thank you. In Montgomery County, she says, people don't realize there are so many people like her who are living one day at a time. You don't see a lot of people sleeping on the streets because they have friends that they can stay with, but they only can stay with them maybe a day at a time, a week at a time. I think it, it's something that goes unnoticed in Montgomery County because it, it's so rich and the development is just, you know, booming and new apartments are going up and, you know, new stores are going up. So I really don't think that people pay attention to it. I think that they just, you know, they're doing fine and that's, you know, that's all they see. She told us she changed her cell phone plan and doesn't go out so she can have extra money for emergencies. In order to get off all assistance, she said she would have to go back to school and get a degree in order to get a job that would pay her enough to do so. She said none of her neighbors know about her struggles. It's just not something she and others like her are comfortable sharing. Sometimes we want to go unnoticed because we want, you know, just to feel accomplished and just to finish it all and just, you know, not even, you know, talk about it, just finish it, not even, you know, tell our stories because some of us are ashamed, some of us are embarrassed. We don't want people to look at us because I do live in this nice house. I have a car that I paid off. Um, I have a flat screen TV, you know, like certain things like that. Some women are just like, well, they're going to talk about us. Where I lived before, we had home inspections. And if they bought a new piece of furniture, they were questioned about it. But I think we deserve nice things if we pay all of our bills and, you know, we're taking care of our business and our kids are taken care of. We deserve to have some nice things. This is the spaces where we do this. And so you can Mark Bergell is the founder of A Wider Circle, a county nonprofit whose goal it is to help individuals and families lift themselves out of poverty. The organization started in 2001 and in its first year served just over 1,000 people. This year, A Wider Circle will serve more than 20,000 people in need. I think the Newport consists of one, folks who have come from other countries. Uh, who are still yet to find a way to support their families uh, with everything they need from rent and utilities to the stuff that we provide. There are people who are moving out of D.C., um, maybe not even by their own choice, but being pushed out of D.C. and or coming over from Prince George's County. Uh, those folks are also in need. And then there are some people who are just affected by the economic downturn. And those folks uh, are less in need, but, you know, if you're in need, it feels significant to you. So it's made up of about three or four different types of folks. In Montgomery County, a family of four would need an annual income of $73,000 just to pay for basic housing, transportation, food, and other essentials. Yvette Sharps is a single mom with two children. A year ago, she didn't know where her next meal was coming from. She met Councilmember Florine and our crew at a wider circle and shared some of her story. It's really hard because I guess when you're not making enough per hour, I should say, I have other bills that I'm trying to catch on. I still can't catch on. So the main, that's what motivated me to go back to school. I look back, I think about some people that I went to school with. They went to college, university and all that. They're making a little more. You have to make certain amount, amount mm -hmm. per hour to really catch up on it. I'm thinking maybe $20 an hour. That's maybe what $50 you see. An hour. That's what you need to catch up on your bills. Yes. That's, that's, that's a what you need. pretty you uh, big hourly uh, hour payment. After yeah. taxes and everything, uh, you don't really have enough. It was Sharp's six-year-old daughter that brought the family situation to the attention of school officials. One year ago, she told her teacher she would not be getting any Christmas presents. That's all it took to get the wheels turning. You, I'm trying to get somewhere. Well, I'm doing it for myself and for my kids to create a better life. Thanks to a wider circle, Yvette has an apartment in Tacoma Park. Her mother came to this country to help take care of her two children. We visited her there and she told Councilmember Florine about her busy schedule. 
So tell me about what your day is like. I get up at five in the morning, take the bus at 5.30 to get to work by six. And then I leave work at two and then I take the bus from work and I have to go to downtown Silver Spring to take uh, the Q2 bus mm -hmm. to my classes are on a different campuses. Oh my. I go to Tacoma Park campus and then Rackville campus. Easier if I have a car. I will get to places in 30 minutes instead of an hour and a half. So what time do you get home? About 10, 30, 11. Oh boy. At night, yes. When do you see your children? Every little um, moment count. Uh, it's precious. <laughs> when I get my five minutes, ten minutes, it's precious. But I'm so lucky. My mom is here, so I'm just using her presence as an opportunity to get these things done. Along with nonprofits like a wider circle, the faith community has also seen its role in serving the poor change. Arlita's pantry at Woodside Methodist Church in Silver Spring has experienced a surge in demand. Each weekend, the church distributes food to families from all over the county, and their numbers have tripled since the pantry opened its doors in 2005. It used to be decreasing week by week. Really? First week was the heaviest, and then we'd get down to last week of the month, and it would be the lowest, but it's... It's, it's not constant, it looks yeah, like. Yeah. It's a constant yeah. level of need That's there. So this is our food pantry. This is the closet where all the canned goods are, found, are, are kept. This is just for one week, right? This is going to be gone. It'll be gone on Saturday. We limit the, num the amount of food to two bags. Um, so the idea is to feed two people for two days. And then, you know, depending on how many people in your family. And you can only come once a month. But those are the only restrictions that we place on it. It doesn't matter what zip code you're in, what income bracket you're in. If you're hungry, you can get food here. Ann and Ed Metcalf are regular volunteers at the pantry. They say they do it because part of being a community is taking care of one another. And they have the means to do just that. Ann Metcalf says the reality of the extent of poverty in Montgomery County really sunk in when she ran into an acquaintance while working at the pantry. And she said, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, I've lost my job, I may lose my house, I may lose my car. And when she left, I thought, wow, you know, we're all that close, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that could be any one of us. We figure if people are coming here, they're putting their pride behind them and coming to tell us that they need food. Some fruit and veggies and beans and soup. It didn't quite sink in while we were back here, putting the bags in, but once I went out there and saw the people coming in and getting the bags um, at the front desk, then it really, it really sunk in, then, and that's when it felt nice. Not only are the churches feeding the poor, they are also providing rental and utility assistance and even helping with housing. At Woodside Methodist, there's a pastor's emergency fund dedicated to those requests. A lot of social service agencies will give a little of the story of the person that they're helping, and um, it, often it's, it's people who are employed, um, but they aren't employed with, they aren't employed full time, or they don't have health benefits, or they've been sick or injured, or taking care of uh, someone who is sick or injured, and so then they can't they can't make ends meet and they can't pay their utility bill or they can't pay their rent um, and they have to choose between medication or food or rent and so we're just trying to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. The WSSC offers help to those folks who are having trouble paying their water and sewer bill. Ratepayers can round up their bill payments to the nearest dollar with the extra change being donated to a fund to assist those customers in need. In 2012, 602 customers were assisted, totaling more than $155,000. This is, looks like chicken with some vegetable sauce. Two young Montgomery County residents who are students at the University of Maryland are doing their part filling in the gaps through their work in the Food Recovery Network. We just knew a lot of a lot of community service organizations that are like working towards um, similar go goals of like helping our community. 
This organization collects unused food from campus dining halls and distributes it to the faith community. You know, food is precious and there's absolutely no reason for that food to go to waste if it doesn't have to. So we estimate each school um, probably throws away somewhere around 10,000 pounds of good food um, every year. We knew the volunteers would be up for it and it's pretty much a no-brainer. Every day we're seeing more and more families that are in need, more and more families that need food, more and more families that have to make a choice. Do I feed my family? Do I put a roof over their head? Do I keep the utilities on? So it's important that they can get food, they can get quality food, they can get a variety of food. And one of our greatest challenges has been to provide meat and proteins. So this is a wonderful addition to what we already are able to do. Everyone needs help right now. And so we're trying Trying to you know use this to provide uh, food for not only needy families for the homeless but really identifying uh, uh, a needs that are from our school system we work with a family care program out of our school system and it's just I'm just so proud of them I'm just so grateful to be a, a part of what they're doing thank you so much thank you, Pat. Appreciate it. this project the skills that we're learning outside of the classroom has in my opinion, been more beneficial than what we're learning sitting in a lecture hall. <laughs> Thank you so much for what you do. As a value, you know, we say there should be no homeless family that's sleeping on the street on a park bench or in a car. Um, children shouldn't go hungry. I is it better to divert people from acute care, from hospital-based care, into preventive care, if that's appropriate? So when you take those kinds of um, values and, and um, um, requirements that we place on ourselves as a community, then how do we respond to that? And that takes the kind of effort that we see in this county. The reality is there are hungry people in Montgomery County and many of them are children. Nearly one third of the county's 144,000 students qualify for free and reduced meals twice the number of those who were eligible in the 90s and more than the entire school population of the District of Columbia. To qualify, a family of four must have a yearly income of less than $41,000. What do you like about your lunch? <laughs> SNAP, the federal food program that used to be called food stamps, provides residents with about $4.28 a day for food. In February, officials and nonprofit leaders pledged to live off a food budget of $5 for five days. See, the great thing is asparagus is on sale for $2.99, yeah. so this will actually probably last me for about three or four days. You know, I've got the potatoes here that are on sale. Between these two items alone, you know, I'm saving $3.50, which is almost one day of the budget for SNAP. For Councilmember Florine, stepping outside of her comfort zone was eye-opening. Mm -hmm. I've taken advantage on uh, a sale on instant oatmeal. It's tough, you know, look at the price of milk. Of whole wheat bread is extraordinary. Uh, fruits and vegetables are very expensive these days. Uh, it's very difficult to cobble together a diet uh, that's, that's healthy. I'm told there are, there's meat on sale, that's where I'm going. The challenge was led by Councilmember Valerie Irvin. Oh, that's the expensive red. I can't, I can't afford that. <laughs> Who, along with her colleagues, hopes to raise the awareness. Thank you so much. Of poverty in our community. And this is just not about myself or my colleagues doing this. Apples. Yeah, I'm going to grab some apples now. It's about raising the awareness of poverty in our community. And as elected officials and policymakers, what we can do about it. Another official who participated in the challenge was Tim Warner. He is the chief engagement officer with Montgomery County Public Schools. He says issues of poverty show up in the schools on a daily basis. Those students uh, come to school hungry, uh, typically. Sometimes the only meal that some of those students get is at school. And we do a great job of providing them with schools. And we work with some of our nonprofits, like MANA. Uh, there's a wonderful smart sack program where uh, sort of inconspicuously uh, children are allowed to, uh, our backpacks are prepared with food in them for the children to eat on the weekend in, in an inconspicuous way. It's a wonderful program and lots of our faith communities partner to, to pack and distribute those bags. So we're doing lots of uh, novel things to help with that. Tim Warner grew up in a suburban ghetto just outside of Philadelphia. 
Before taking the position with the schools, he worked for the county executive where it was his job to find people in the county who needed help but just didn't know how to go about getting it. He's taking what he learned there to find new ways to close the persistent and widening achievement gap in the schools. It's not something the schools can teach its way out of, he says, because today there are many other things that impact how a student performs. We focus an awful lot in Montgomery County Public Schools on the core of learning, how uh, the curriculum and the student and the teacher all interact uh, on behalf of learning. But um, what I found is that it takes more than that, right? Our, our students come from somewhere. They come from a community and cultural context where things are happening or things are not happening that impact how the student engages the teacher and how the student engages the curriculum. And culturally, we're going to have to really learn, relearn how to, how to understand the instructional core with a community layer wrapped around it. The suburban poor are growing in numbers, and Warner says the challenge is to reach more deeply into the community to find the folks in need. Both Warner and Burgell say the key to solving this crisis is getting the folks who have plenty to take notice of those who don't. Overall, there's a wide disparity in awareness of poverty in addition to just the income levels we have. So I think the, the wide gap in income levels is a bit of a metaphor for the awareness issue. Um, I know that you could go to certain parts of our county and think the economy is thriving and it must be the best economy we've ever had. And, and then you could go to the neighborhoods where we serve and you could think, how can this possibly endure? How are we not doing more? So that's part of my job and I think it's part of all of our jobs once we know about something to spread that word. Lisa Morris is a Montgomery County resident who donates regularly at Mana Food. She says she believes as citizens it's important we take care of our own. There's just a lot of need in the county and a lack of awareness. And I have friends who go to Africa and go to foreign countries, and we don't need to go very far away to help. So I feel really strongly about, you know, s starting at home. Good afternoon. Thank you for calling Mana Food. This is Donna. How can I help you? Well, I was always the room mother that collected the food, and I never knew where it went. I mean, I knew it went to Mana, but I never knew where Mana was. And so when I came in here, I didn't realize the need was as great as it is. Um, I, I've been really surprised by how many people are just really struggling. Which comes back to the challenge of identifying those who are in distress and finding creative ways to help our neighbors in need. In the words of Tim Warner, to empower communities. Each of us has some power that we can give away. Uh, sometimes it's writing a check, sometimes it's building a relationship, sometimes it's inviting a needy family to sit at your table with your family uh, and, and build relationships there. Uh, there are a thousand ways to do it. All of our nonprofits who are service providing have lots of ways to, to get involved. And to break the cycle of poverty in our community, officials say you have to help the kids, but you can't forget about the adults. So adult education programs have to be every bit the priority that youth education programs are. And I, I think we need to teach them all the skills that we think they ought to have, whether it's, and that they kind of show that they need. So whether it's job skills, reading and writing, basic math, basic communication skills, all of the things that may have come to so many of us just because of where we were born. By the time we got out of high school, college was the natural step. By the time we got out of college, we could write, we could do a resume, we could interview. These things kept, came kind of naturally for us and or our parents provided that support and nurturing. That's missing. It's missing for people who are living in poverty and in need. And so we have to kind of go back then and be their family. The, the best thing uh, to do for folks in need is to have a healthy and robust economy that's generating jobs and opportunity. Um, there's no easy solution to that. Uh, also critically important is um, an outstanding educational system because education is the ladder of opportunity for all people. So it's multifaceted. What's going on in their house? Sometimes there's unemployment, there might be mental health issues, there might be homelessness, there might be incarceration, you know, so many things going on in, in those households where we can step in and do something. And so, and if your health is poor and you can't hold a job, then you're going to have social needs on the other end. So I think these, these issues are incredibly interrelated. And you cannot just treat one presenting issue, you often have to treat the whole I have lunch, I have socks, I have underwear, gloves, and everything that 
keep me fresh for the winter. I want to thank Montgomery County for putting this event together. Though there is no question Montgomery County has a robust nonprofit and faith community, Alawalia says doing a better job of telling our story is critical in order to engage the community. I think we can do a lot more, a lot more, and we've just cleaned up our own website um, as another step. You know, how do we come into the 21st century using social media and using the web in a way to also communicate more? Because even our our customer base is much more tech savvy using mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And so that whole issue of community engagement, community involvement, um, and also involving them in the delivery process requires a fair amount of improvements on our side. Tim Warner says the challenge is to fix the plane while it's flying. It's precarious, he says, but it's what they are going to do. Part of the strategy, rather, would be to make schools the, the center of community engagement uh, so that the, the teachers and principals who know the students and who know the community well, uh, to provide them with tools that enable them to reach more deeply into the community and form the partnerships. And Mark Burgell says any conversation on the word poverty has to focus on the word priority and that we should not tolerate anything that nurtures poverty. We would make it priority one to say who's in need and every of our decisions as the county and our decisions as businesses and our decisions as schools say how do we take care of those most in need. Everything we talk about in a spiritual sense or when we're acting spiritually or being you know wherever we go on weekends for our spiritual um, time and we say we love one another, the, we love the least healthy among us or we'll take care of the people who need it the most, we say that. We just need to make that our seven day a week life. And our single mother, her goal is to provide the best life she possibly can for her daughters and her hope is to someday be able to live without assistance. As far as, you know, a hard working person working full time, getting the benefits and struggling, I think that, you know, one day it's gonna get better. But basically I wanna be a business owner <laughs> and have, you know, strong women, strong kids that want to give back and help because we once, you know, were, you know, low income and we've come from the bottom to the top. And all the hard work is going to pay off. And if I keep, you know, reaching and accomplish short-term goals and then set long-term goals, I think I'll, I'll make it. That wraps up this special edition of The Bottom Line. If you are in need of help from any of the services we featured in our show or you would like to volunteer your time to those in need, Get a pen and paper and stay tuned as we bring you contact information for those agencies. I'm Susan Kennedy. Thanks for tuning in.